So it's a great pleasure to introduce Tony Horowitz to all of you. You've all met him through reading his book, which they read in advance on YouTube here, A Voyage Long and Strange, which Tony wrote partially here at the JCB and uh, used many of our illustrations, including the great cover one, which looks a bit like an Edward Gorey in the <laughs> Tony, Tony has proven something that uh, many of your students would find difficult to believe that it's possible to study history intensively and have a lot of fun at the same time. And you can tell that every sentence that he, he writes, he's enjoying the pursuit of the past. And that is allowed. We are allowed to have fun at what we've chosen to do. Um, it's been, for me, really exciting to get to know him. We, we talked about the, the black legend this morning. About a year ago, I, I didn't know what that was. I just, I studied Anglo-American history my whole time in grad school, and I, I, I was and I still am pretty ignorant of the Spanish part of the story, although I'm trying to do better, and this week has helped me a lot. But there was a brilliant op-ed in the New York Times in July of 06, I can't quite remember, so two years ago, but on the black legend and how wrong it was and how, how blinkered we tend to be as citizens of the U.S. and ignoring the huge part of our history that is Hispanic. <coughs> and that got me excited to, to read Tony's forthcoming book, and I, I guess I found you by email. I was sort of an internet stalker, really. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in the final stages and, and needed a place to finish up the book. And he, he lives on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off of, um, off of the United States, uh, off of Massachusetts, <laughs> and not too far from here. So we had a nice time last fall for a few months. And, um, as I was writing my book and putting it through its paces, I haven't mentioned to you, I have a pretty new book out. And Tony, last spring, sent me this uh, email with a note of alarm with a copy of an article from Publishers Weekly that announced that David McCullough, America's favorite historian, was writing a book with nearly the same title as mine on the exact same topic. It was coming out one month earlier. And I sent it to my publisher, this very proper gentleman, who issued a stream of four-syllable <laughs> words that I've never heard of. <laughs> it was an amazing day. And then he said, you know, by the way, it is April 1st. Is it possible to always play a joke? He <laughs> 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 <It> was. So, <laughs> the story is <laughs> So we, we thought we had a conversation with all of you. I know you're going to hear from him about why he wrote this book. and. Um, what, it, what the writing process was like and how he writes history in, in a different voice than many of the authors we read in a song. I think it's fair to say it's a more journalistic voice. But even that's not quite the right word because it's, it's primarily in the first person. It's about his search for the artifacts and the places where this happened. And there's not a lot of me in history, usually. And I, I think that might be something we talk about profitably because asking your students to put themselves into their essays might be something they, they enjoy a lot. They're still figuring out who they are in grade school and high school. And, and just to write about a trip to a place like a Plymouth plantation or a California mission or the Alamo might, might work quite well. So um, I guess I should begin with an obvious question. Where, where did this book come from? You, Tony wrote a very well-known book about the Civil War, Confederates in the Attic, which I'm sure many of you have read. But how, how did you go back 200, 300 years from, you were doing great as a Civil War guy. There was no need to, to leave that to good niche. A lot of people buy Civil War books, but then you took this plunge into the, the deep cast. Publishers would say you should stay with it. Right. Um, there was a good essay written by um, Adam Hochschild, who's a journalist who writes history, and he talks about the big three uh, the Founding Fathers, the Civil War, and World War II account for, I forgot the percentage, but some blinding percentage of uh, all the history books that come out in America every year. Um, and that there's so many Civil War books that it's uh, essentially one book has been published every day since Appomattox. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, I don't know. I think I was uh, really drawn to this era just out of my own ignorance. Um, I, uh, someone who 
as I talk about in the book, I, I was someone who really thought of myself as a history nerd since early childhood. Uh, was the kind of kid who lined up my little plastic presidents, you know, by my bed every night before I went to sleep in order. Um, you know, my siblings thought I was uh, insufferable um, and studied history here at Brown and, you know, thought I had a grip on American history and then realized that really I didn't have a clue about this era that you've been talking about all week. Um, so I think that was one starting point. Another was um, in between the Civil War book and this one, I did a book about Captain Cook, uh, Blue Latitudes. And Captain Cook was really the uh, first European to explore much of the Pacific. And what I loved about his story, uh, my wife's Australian, so that was, uh, I, I had spent a lot of time in Australia and became interested in Captain Cook. But what I loved about his story was really the drama of first contact between European and Native peoples. Um, this is an experience that we really can't have no matter how far we travel, yet 200 years ago, Cook in the Pacific had it innumerable times. Um, and as I was doing that book, I think at some point the light bulb went on that, you know, I don't know anything about that story in America, that we start generally with, we sort of do our unit on Columbus and then our, our unit on the Pilgrims, and there might be a little bit in between, but we kind of actually skip over what to me is, is this very rich story, which is what happened when kind of the old world and the new world first collided, uh, you know, uh, in mostly in the 16th century. Uh, and again, sort of here I was, I knew all about that story in the Pacific, and I knew nothing about that story here in America, and I kind of suspected that many Americans uh, shared my ignorance. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the starting point. You, you, um, you must have read widely before starting. Mean, what, what is your writing process? You just start reading, and is it general books? Do you go for academic books? Pop novel novelizations? Um, I, you know, generally, uh, I mean, I, I tend to bite into top, big topics that I don't necessarily know a lot about at the start which is maybe a different approach from a, an academic historian who uh, begins with a subject that, that they know a lot about and try and build on that and sort of burrow in and, and have quite a, maybe a quite a narrow focus and try and uncover new material. Um, and it's not really my mission. So I uh, you know, begin by reading generally secondary works and uh, in this case, um, uh, Samuel Eliot Morrison, a name that's probably come up this week. You know, one of the great, you know, great place to start. Big magisterial, great read, a bit old-fashioned, but great place to start. And then uh, books like that, and then start looking at their sources, and you know, getting to the primary sources, and then just really losing myself in the material. Uh, I think again, that's um, maybe how uh, my approach as a, a non-professional historian would be different. Um, I like to, I guess I found as a journalist, the best stories are always the ones you're not looking for at the start. And that there's value to simply getting lost in your material um, for, for until you start to see a path or a theme or, or a particular way of, of approaching it and then, then focusing in from there. I didn't go into Tony's CV, but he was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and other publications and won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. And he wrote a book about Iraq well before there was a clear ago. reason to write about Iraq. Uh, and it's amazing you mentioned Morrison. We were talking a bit about him this morning. Kristen teaches um, with Morrison and Howard Zinn, who are in many ways the opposite. And I guess Zinn actually attacks Morrison. I forgot about that. But um, I think Morrison is amazing. I know the camera's running and it will probably end my academic career to say that I like him. But I, I do think he's a great writer and puts you in the story. He, he uses the first person. He has a few books. It's like I went to follow in Columbus's flips out, and it's really ripping stuff. He brings his nautical knowledge to bear. He, well, he's a wonderfully lively writer. Uh, his footnotes are fabulous. Um, he also is a great writer about writing history. Uh, I forgot the names of the essays, maybe you would know. He, he wrote several essays about writing history. And one of the things he said that struck me is that sort of you can learn more about Western pioneering by taking a camping trip than reading all the books in you know, <laughs> Widener Library. And it's a little flip, but I think um, I also take a little inspiration from him in terms of hands-on history that, um, yes, history is document-based, but yeah, you can take it a step further. You can do as he did and sail around the Caribbean in the wake of Columbus, or in my case, do a bit of reenacting, or simply to go to the places where history happened. Um, 
uh, by all accounts, he was a terrible man. I don't know. I mean, uh, a terrible misogynist. He refused to teach Radcliffe uh, students. Exactly. And uh, was famous for savage reviews that I think in one case killed a fellow historian who I mean, killed wow. over after reading wow. a Samuel Elliott <laughs> Morrison review of his newest book. But I, I think he, uh, you know, uh, writes in a way that not many people do today. That kind of a little bit like Shelby Foote with the Civil War. That kind of sweeping right. narrative history uh, in a way that people are become much more specialized, I would say, uh, since then. You've heard a story about Morrison going to an American Historical Association conference, and there was a reception filled with people, and he walked in a diagonal line from one corner to the opposite, and the crowd kind of parted, and then he walked back to where he started, and someone said, what are you doing? And he said, can't you see I'm mixing? <laughs> <laughs> he was very patrician. Yeah. He rode his horse, too. Did he? Yeah, yeah. Tell Harvard. I think he had a horse or something. Anyway, interesting. interesting. Do any of you assign um, novels in your classes? Uh, any like young adults novels? Or I mean, Johnny Johnny Tremaine was very important to me when I was thirteen or so. I, I would imagine. And it, it, yes, is that? I mean, does that work still? I thought the historical fiction. Uh, I've assigned the. Uh, the Shahar book on the First World War, and the children really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a supplement, maybe not as so much a teaching tool, but it gets them excited about it. They mm -hmm. get involved, and they actually read it, which is a challenge. Each year, I require each when we study uh, westward expansion, they're required to select a historical uh, fiction book and report on it. And they have to make connections between themselves and the, the historical period and the characters in the mm -hmm. book. Do you ever ask your students to write fiction in a historical setting? Yeah, I think that can work well, too. Uh, you, you mentioned reenacting. And that's always an entertaining part of your books. Um, this scene with the clanking arm, armor is just fantastic <laughs> in this one. Is that Florida? Yeah. Yeah, we have two Floridians here you know, up in the back. And you know how hot it is. <laughs> Clunk around in our. Do, do any of you work with reenactors at all in your A couple. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I uh, for the earlier book, Confederates in the Attic, where the main character in the book was a Confederate reenactor. And I invited him to speak to my son's um, fourth grade class. and. Uh, they loved him, but uh, all they wanted to hear about was the gun, mm -hmm. you know, which he, of course, wasn't allowed to bring into the school. And he went into mock outrage, and he wasn't allowed to bring in his musket. And all they just spent the entire hour asking him about you know, how, do you, how do you load your gun, how many shots do you fire, um, which, I mean, again, I haven't been in on the week's conversation, but, you know, kids love gore. Um, let's face it, uh, particularly boys, uh, for particularly some of you are grade school teachers, right? I mean, you can't get away from it. They love the body count. And there's a lot of it with this period, the age of expiration. I mean, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, it's really pulp nonfiction right. uh, compared to kind of pious pilgrims in their funny hats. And, you know, I think, uh, uh, sadly, perhaps, that you can draw students into this simply with the... Uh, the blood and guts aspect, right. and the grisly diseases, and I mean, there's a lot of, I'm sorry, that's not really no, what we're talking about, but uh, I think we do have to acknowledge what, what kids, what, what yeah, kids well, the kids. Yeah, we have grisly diseases um, on our minds this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and cannibalism, a lot of cannibalism. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, that to work with. I'm interested in the fiction thing in, in perhaps a different way, which is, um, I think this period is a wonderful way to teach not just about the content of what happened in the past, but actually to teach about history. What is history? How do we know what we know? What are our sources? Because unlike, say, the Civil War, some fairly recent period where you know, we read what Lincoln wrote and we know to what degree it's reliable, etc., the sources from this period, one, they're often scarce. There are a lot of the figures from this period we really have very little on. And the sources we do have are often quite unreliable. For instance, with the Vikings, the sagas. Well, you can't take the sagas at face value. You can't take the accounts of these explorers at face value. Do they really know what natives are thinking, etc.? So I think it's a, a, there's a, a wonderful opportunity to 
to take some of the documents from this period and say, well, not only what's reliable in this, but what can we learn about the unreliable part of it? The way that Europeans write about natives, for instance, which is often very unreliable, says a lot about their mindset, or, or the artwork, I mean, we can flip through that at, at some point, the way that they depict Indians, obviously is not the way that the Indians actually look. This is an exception. I think this is an attempt at an accurate portrait but of Pocahontas, but in many cases, not. Um, but there's a lot that you can learn from the unreliable aspects. And I think of a document, um, I talked briefly in the book, and maybe you've talked it. Oh, wait, you saw the movie last night, Cabeza de Vaca. Yeah. Well, if any of you have read the account, which I talked about kind of briefly yes. here, it's, it's actually a quite short, very readable, I think certainly for high school students, a very accessible document, great story, he's a sympathetic character. But again, what is it? Is it, a, is it the first American road trip? Is it, a, <laughs> is it a spiritual memoir? Is it a buddy movie? These four guys, you know, doing peyote in the desert. Is it a political manifesto? You could have, I think, wonderful discussions about what do we do with this account as a historical document? Is it even history or is it literature? Um, and I think that's true of many of the sources that I drew on for this book. Um, in a sense, they're just great teaching tools. Um, that history is not just you know a set of facts. We know this and that. Well, it's a lot of interpretation involved. And and what do you do? And, and that applies to the maps, where, as we know, I'm sure you've talked about that, history, you know, these wonderful maps that they did that are entirely fanciful, where they have an inland sea, or right. all kinds of crazy stuff, or, or the artwork. Um, there's a lot, lot to work with that isn't necessarily traditional historical mm -hmm. uh, uh, methodology. I loved your Viking section. I mean, I was expecting this book about the black legend, and then the Viking section mm -hmm. It's really Great, I've been really entertaining, and you've got deeply into the sagas, and, and I've actually read them, which I think very few of us take the time. And we're, Ken was asking this morning, are we medieval or early modern, but the Vikings are pretty medieval. I mean, it's really yeah. old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's wonderful stuff to read. Yeah. I mean, what's wonderful to me about the sagas is they're at once, you know, obviously very distant, about roughly a thousand years ago, at least when they were in spoken form. Uh, yet there's something a bit modern about them. The language isn't off-putting. It's quite, uh, it's quite straight. There's not a lot of embroidering. It, you know, it's just yeah. gets on with the story. You know, you know. Um, and I think the sagas, again, in small doses, uh, might be fun for students to read as a way of uh, exploring again. Uh, a little bit of this period, but also people until recently didn't think there was any historical uh -huh. usefulness at all in the sagas. Well, it turns out there was. And I think Indian oral history for Indian um, beliefs is another another very rich area that you say, well, how do we use this material? How do we use um, Zuni creationists? Mm -hmm. Or they obviously would consider this the Zuni creation beliefs uh, to uh, understand the past. Tony's just finished a, a lengthy book tour for his book. So you went around the country. And, and did, were there any notable response? You did native people's come out to book signs or, or, or Hispanic audiences? And the only uh, negative response, uh, I don't know if any of you remember the book, I go through New Mexico and I talk about a, a conquistador named Oñate, who's a quite notorious figure. Is there anyone from New Mexico here? Or, um, he's the conquistador who uh, is most famous for having cut off the hands and feet of Pueblo Indians in reprisal for a raid. And, um, it's still a very hot issue today. It's almost like the rebel flag in the South, you know. Um, uh, families that trace their ancestry to the early Spanish exalt this man, and, and Native Americans loathe him. And so I had some quite angry uh, uh, Spanish families come in and say, you know, this is all myth, or and one, and several of them came and said, he mistranslated that he didn't cut off their feet, only their toes, which I thought was kind of a strange defense. Um, but actually, on book tour, one of the most interesting things I found was talking to teachers, and I'd be curious to hear about. Many of them said that you know I was saying you know I certainly wasn't taught much about this period in school. Um, is it getting better or worse? And what many of them said, I guess, is with many of the new re requirements in terms of testing, etc., that you're under even more pressure to kind of march through the, the usual curriculum. Is that true? I mean, yes, um, yes. so that, you know, it, in some ways it sounded like it was almost worse in, 
doing than when I was a kid in terms of um, exploring this period. Um, but I, I don't know. I guess it's different in every state. Um, uh, but no, no um, angry Native Americans, at least not yet, but you never know. It's good to know that. Um, I mean, we flip through that. I mean, the other thing, I just, and again, I don't really know what you've been doing all week, but uh, in terms of classroom stuff, these are just images that I got from the, the John Carter Brown Library while I was here and used many of them in my book. Um, and I think, to me, some of these are, are wonderful. One, you know, kids love <coughs> These are kind of weird, weird things from John Smith's um, journal here. He's fighting an Indian. But I'll, I'll find one, one or two that maybe we can uh, talk about. Or that you, it seems to me there are images, this is one of the first images of smoking. You can see these guys with these huge spleefs uh, smoking away. Uh, this is one that fascinates me. I talk about it a bit in the book. Um, and I always toyed with starting the book with it because it's so interesting to me. This is the oldest known artwork by a European done in the Americas. And there's some debate about whether that's true. It's at the New York Public Library. And it's this, you know, little fop. Uh, this little French fop greeting this, you know, giant uh, in a loincloth. Um, but, you know, I think there are a lot of, and unfortunately this is, the original is in color. You know, what, what can you learn or not learn from these images? I mean, did, did the Indians really look like that? What is he wearing? Some kind of weird coon skin. I, I mean, you know, to really study this in depth, what are the foods here? What are these Indians over here doing? They're actually praying to this pole that the French put up. Um, to pair a piece of artwork like this with the documents that we have that tell of this meeting and, and play with that. Uh, I don't know, just to me there's a lot to be done. I love the artwork. Uh, I, I would love to have done more with it in my book, but it's, um, uh, it's very expensive to reproduce pictures and books and there's a limit to what you can do. But anyway, uh, I mean, this is a kind of weird image, early English in, in uh, Roanoke in North Carolina. And if you can see this little girl, has a doll that's obviously been given, a little Elizabethan doll that's obviously been given to her by one of the English. Also, she's got some strange kind of tampon thing going on. Right? I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's a lot to, lot to look at in these. This is the buffalo, obviously, is first drawn by the Spanish. But, um, you know, the JCB is full of this stuff. And, most of it is online, should I not say that? I know, we, we, we're, well, we're trying to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can go to the wonderful JCB Early American Images sites, and I, again, I think for students there's a lot, you know, a lot to work with with the images um, uh, to liven things up, but also just to interpret as another source. And also, from this period, obviously, and probably Charles Mann talked about this earlier in the week, you have archaeology, you know, which brings in, again, a whole another discipline um, a lot of the research for this book was based on visiting archaeological sites, which isn't you know, actually always the most exciting thing, uh, or not as exciting as many people imagine, but still I think um, it, it's a whole other dimension to history, and I think um, the more ways you can approach it with students, the better, you just get them interested. I don't know, but do any of you able, I don't know where you are from, I mean a lot of the these places I talked about in this book are reasonably accessible from Atlanta, parts of Texas. I mean, it depends where you are. In, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, I don't know where, where you are. But also just to physically go to some of these sites or not. I don't know. What are field trips? Are field trips still a big part of the... I mean, my son hates them and always stays home sick. So I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't like buses. So I don't know. But I mean, field, field trips still a big... There'll be a lot less, especially in Florida, because of the cost of gas and oh, our good financial point. situation. Is, yeah. We see a lot less uh, that's, that's a good point. I call it. Um, one part of your book, the, the history and then that crossing of what was actually happening that day or at the, at the point you were writing, and one of the places was the Dominican Republic. That was so depressing. I, I felt like I would really like to know what you thought of that after everything you went through. Oh, you mean the, the, the uncovering of the bones? Or, well, or, just the, or the just whole being experience? In Dominican Republic. Oh, the whole experience right. of the DR. Um, well, one, I think it was a snapshot in time. I, 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 I 
gather things are a little better now. I was there in, I think, a particularly bad time. The government was falling apart, and, and there were a lot of trouble. So um, I, I'm by no means an expert on the Dominican Republic, and haven't been there since. I, it was as accurate a picture as I could give based on the time that I visited. And yeah, it was, it was kind of you know, depressing in one sense, in that the, you know, the place is, is kind of a mess. I mean, the economy is, is clearly a mess in the political system. Um, but uh, culturally, a very, very rich place. And um, I don't know. I don't know what to say, really, to add to what most of what I felt is, is in there, really. Um, so I don't know. Have you spent time there? Or? No, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious about the legacy. Oh, the legacy. Of legacy as it pertains to modern life and, mm -hmm. and whether you had any observations that you didn't include in that book. You mean the history as it sort of weighs on the present? Right. or right. Well, there's one way in which I found the um, Dominican Republic interesting. And really, you know, I spent about 10 years as a foreign correspondent. And really, almost everywhere outside the U.S., most societies are more aware of their past than we are here. Uh, and that's not always a blessing. I mean, I, as a history nut, I wish, you know, we remembered every bit of our history, but I think part of what makes us American is we're quite forward-looking. And we just, we, we don't uh, tend to dwell on our past the way that, uh, for instance, when I covered Yugos the former Yugoslavia, where people would talk about the Battle of Kosovo as, as if it was yesterday between um, Christians and Muslims, I think it was in the 13th century, yeah. someone helped me. But you know, it took me a few days there before I realized that this battle that everyone kept talking about <laughs> had occurred 700 years ago or more. Um, in Northern Ireland, the same, you know, they'll talk about King Billy, you know, uh, William of Orange, you know, from the late 17th century, again, as if it was yesterday. Uh, Middle East, obviously. So, um, uh, you know, in the DR, I think, you know, more so than in this country, I sense people are, you know, people are more aware of that historical legacy, and as you could tell from reading it, quite angry still about the Spanish and their uh, effect, you know, on the area and, and what happened to Native people there. So, um, in that sense, I found it a very rewarding place to travel because one frustration with doing this book is, um, you know, there were many parts, part of the, largely that I left out of the book, where just people were unaware, you know, of the history, where I would go around for days asking people about it or retracing some bit of history, and there really wasn't anything to grab onto, and I didn't want to force it, I didn't want to pretend that, you know, this history was vivid for people when it's not, so I focused on the places where it was, but uh, generally speaking, I think almost anywhere outside America, people are a little a little more attuned to, to the legacy of the past. Yeah. Was there a particular region that you really fell in love with, or the history, or the richness of it, or you wanted to revisit if you were going to maybe expand on a particular chapter in your book? Where would you like to expand? Uh, I think for what I was doing, the Southwest uh, clearly was the richest, at least in this country, because uh, a couple reasons. One. Uh, the landscape is less changed, uh, you know, uh, with apologies to whoever's here from Florida. I mean, so much of Florida, for instance, where a great deal of the history in this period takes place has simply been paved over. And that's true in, in many parts of the country. It's actually hard to even see that historic landscape. Well, the Southwest obviously has changed a lot, but you can still find large stretches of it where you drive and you're reading Coronado's account and, it, you know, it looks looks the same. You know, you can, you can see the landscape that they're describing. Uh, but I think more importantly, you have culturally, you have the Spanish and the, the Pueblo Indians still on the premises. So uh, there are the Zuni, for instance, in New Mexico, who are in the exact spot where the Spanish encountered them uh, in 1540. Um, so I think um, there's a, you know, much more awareness there, again, of, of uh, uh, pers you know, people feel it personally there in a way that in other parts of the country tends to be much more abstract. Okay, yeah, some history happened here hundreds of years ago, but it doesn't really connect to me. Well, in uh, parts of the Southwest, uh, particularly Pueblo Indians and old Spanish families, feel that history very intensely and, and still debate about it. And so for my purposes, that, that was the most uh, exciting, I guess. But really, almost anywhere, you know, uh, you can find good interesting materials that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't exclude. Did you see that um, just last week on 
PBS, at least in the New York area, there was um, a documentary called The Last Conquistador. Did you hear anyone? Uh, it was about, um, it was about a, a, a sculpture that was commissioned by the city of El Paso to, 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 to celebrate Latino and Hispanic pride. And they chose to do, and it's just so bizarre that I was watching this at the time I was reading your book, about Oñate, the yeah. conquistador. And what ensued was a very heated debate between the, uh, the Acaba Pueblo Native Americans who went to El Paso to talk about the fact that how could you celebrate this man who was a butcher? And the, the artist who I, you know, we were talking about the black legend today, who was really that really <coughs> bad, said, well, every group has a bad history and a negative history, and these people were going on, but he cut off the people's leg. And I thought it was very easy for these pe this, this artist, the see of El Paso, to kind of explain, well, nothing is so black and white. And I thought, how would it be if someone was making a, a sculpture of Hitler and a bunch of Jews or gypsies went up there. Well, they, they, they would say that's understandable, but yet there's this kind of way of explaining away kind of the complexity of the conquest. And right. so... No, I mean, you know, and I talked about it in the book, and I mean, it's funny, Onyate, for some reason, is the one, I mean, there were a lot of butchers in this period, but for some reason he's the one who's the real lightning rod. I... I found it very similar to what I found writing about Confederate memory in the South, where there's kind of no middle ground here, and, and there's a, a kind of an in-your-face thing going on. Uh, for instance, when I was traveling the South writing about Confederates in the attic, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the real diehard Confederates, and Robert E. Lee is, is one thing, Nathan Bedford Forrest was renowned during the war for killing black troops, afterwards was implicated in founding the KKK. He's a, you know, uh, an understandably very unpopular figure with African Americans in the South. Yet there would again be people who were determined to put up statues of him or rename things after Nathan Bedford Forrest. And so these things are, are still kind of going on. And I think a lot of it is really comes out of having a personal connection. And those Spanish families in, in New Mexico feel they've been there for 500 years or 400 years or more. And, and um, you know, to them, it's just honoring their heritage. I would say something else, though, about what I talk about a little bit in the book. There's something about the Spanish, too. We have great difficulty looking at them with any balance. That somehow they have to be, you know, the black legend or the white legend. They have to be absolute villains or <laughs> saintly bearers of Christianity and culture. And I think even professional historians have had a very hard time somehow treating them with balance, and, and maybe Ken could speak on this. I mean, do you find well, yeah, that's, and we actually had a long discussion oh, this okay. morning about just that, just that yeah. topic about the long shadow of the black legend yeah. and how it exists even till today right. in some, yeah. some aspects. <laughs> but and the flip side as well, all in the others. And in the, the whole Spanish historiography under, under Franco, up until Franco's death, was, was basically that dichotomy that you just laid out, I mean, the Spaniards are bringers of death and destruction, or great bearers of culture and, and Christianity. And it's only in the last 20 years that, that Spanish historiography has started to come to grips with it in a more kind of nuanced way. Right. And, and that kind of primary research is filtering into US historiography and other historiography. There are some good works, but it really, it, it, it's in some ways a very specialist history to really get to the nuances. And uh, in, in some ways, there's some things we're just never going to know. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to be lost in the midst of time. There's one book that I cited in my notes. Um, if anyone wants to look into this further, Weber, um, I thought, did by far the best or most balanced. I think it's David Weber. Um, oh, yeah. I think this is a, really a must-read. David Weber, The Spanish Frontier in North America, was one of the few that I really felt was really balanced. And he goes into the black legend, the white legend, and you know really lays out all of that. And I thought um, it's a very accessible book. It's written in a very uh, straightforward manner, no jargon. It's uh, I, I thought it was a, you know the, the, one of the best of the books that I read on Spanish. Um, it's a nice bibliography. Exactly.
Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's important to show yeah. people a little bit the architecture of, of, of your research without, I chose not to do footnotes, so you can go both ways with that, but I, I didn't want to pretend that this is a formal academic mm -hmm. history because it's, it's not, but I think, you know, yeah, you do want to give readers some, some God. Um, uh, well, something that struck me, and maybe it's because I'm a New Englander, and, um, I'm not Southwest, and you know, at least border disputes, and, but taking these contemporary issues that in the framework that you put it in is, um, I think it's compared to Walter, you know, the Spanish are still invading us, or, or taking these immigration issues and putting it into that long shadow of the black legend. I never thought about it that way. Um, and it might just be because it's not something that I'm experiencing every single day in the geographic where I live. Uh, I mean, I think that's a challenge with all history. I mean, you don't want to go overboard and saying, you know, it's relevant, it's yeah, relevant. Yeah. On the other hand, I do think, yeah, you always have to find ways to explain to students that why these, these aren't just funny people in wigs from a long time ago. That, you know, there is, I mean, Ted's, if I can do a ad, short advertisement for Ted's book, Ark of the Liberties, a lot of it is about the whole Puritan vision of us being a city on a hill um, and sort of the expectations of last days, that, that their religious vision courses all through American history. And reading the book, it's again, you just keep realizing, oh my god, this history is still with us in all kinds of ways that we may not even recognize. And I think that's, um, I don't know, you, you tell me how much students respond to that, but I think, yeah, if you can bring it into the present, and certainly the immigration debate, I think, offers um, an opportunity to just talk about, well, are the Spanish really newcomers here, or are we the newcomers? Um, and back to that black legend in Oñate for a moment, um, I think uh, another thing is, you know, again, in that inability to, to look at this with balance, uh, sadly, it's a, as brutal as some of these figures were, uh, I would argue that the English were, were generally just as bad if you read this period. It's, you can find plenty of English Oñates if you read particularly the Jamestown story, where they're constantly going out and lopping off people's heads and I mean, just terrible stuff. And from a slightly later period in New England, so we may be familiar with, uh, it was in Mystic, Connecticut, where they, uh, the great uh, slaughter of someone over here, Penobscot, or there's a famous 1637 image of them oh, yeah. surrounding and setting the Pequot. Yeah. Um, and where the writing about it by the English is sort of glorying in this burning of infidels. So I think we should be careful, you know, uh, in how we approach the Spanish in. I, I don't think in any sense we should let them off the hook, but I think we should recognize that uh, some of this is just old-fashioned prejudice that, that really the English, the French actually do come off better, I have to say. <laughs> uh, not always, but you know, I, I would say, I know you're, you're, you're an apologist, but I'm a little bit, yeah. um, they do come off a bit better, but certainly the, uh, the English and the Spanish are you know, uh, pretty much neck and neck in terms of, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed in your book was your conversations with the locals. And it seems like you have a gift to seek out very interesting and a lot of times unintentionally funny people. Um, was there a, a time in your journey that you thought to yourself, I don't believe I got into the truck with this one? Is yeah. there something like that? <laughs> um, Less so in this book than in earlier books. I mean, maybe it's just an age thing. I, I, um, in some of my earlier books, I definitely got into situations where I thought, what am I doing in this bar? Or, you know, um, uh, maybe a little bit in that car in the Dominican Republic with the crazy driving and the um, uh, reformed drunk who wasn't so reformed. Um, and, uh, you know, a few moments. But, you yeah, know, it's always a tricky question. You want to kind of push it and you want to get into interesting situations and see what happens, but yeah, you don't want to end up you know, beaten to death by the road. Um, I, I would say with this book, not so much, but certainly in earlier books and traveling around the Middle East, and I did a, my first book was about hitchhiking around the Australian outback, where people measure distance and the number of beers consumed on routes. So if you say, how far is it to Boston? And they'd say, oh, I reckon that's six pack. Um, so, I, you know, I basically traveled across this entire country with drunk drivers, and um, so, but I was younger then. So. I have a question about the writing process. Is, is, is a 
your book in many ways, you know, relies on interesting characters to give it to give it, you know, its it, it speed and interest. And I wonder if you ever feel <coughs> uncomfortable in, you know, revealing a character who reveals himself to you in a perhaps less than flattering manner, like the Kayanaba. Kayanaba. You know, he inv- invited you into his, you know, life, and, and he helped to really helped you to write your Dominican story and he comes across again in a way that perhaps his friends and he might not like and I wonder if you ever feel I wonder how you ever feel about putting that into paper for the world to see it's a really tricky issue and not just with book writing certainly uh, as a journalist you know you feel it every time you do a story you know it's uh, people who aren't necessarily savvy about the press it's one thing if you're interviewing a public official and they say stick their foot in it well you know they know the rules of the game um, the way I deal with it is to always make it clear to people what I'm up to. I don't hide the fact that I'm a writer. I have my notebook out. I always explain that, you know, this is something I'm going to write in a book. I don't want to deceive anybody that, you know, um, uh, about what's going on. And I think um, if you're fair and accurate, um, I, I think uh, sort of just telling it like it is without being gratuitous. I mean, if somebody really... I don't know, says, you know, something about their spouse or something, you know, something that just doesn't, it doesn't even relate to your subject. Um, uh, it, it's a tricky issue, but over time I've found that just telling it like it is, is the best route, not overthinking that, because the times people are unhappy with you, it's never what you think it would be for. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll just give you an example, for instance, in this book I write about the woman in Florida who's a, quite a fundamentalist, mm-hmm. evangelical, and, I wasn't sure, she was very hospitable to me, I spent a week with her. I wasn't sure how she was going to receive what I wrote about her. She called me up the other day and just loved it, giving the book to all her friends. Well, there you go, she said, you, you, you got it right. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but many people I think read it think just plain nuts, think she's, she's crazy. So, there you go. Um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough question and I guess, um, uh, I don't have a good answer other than I try to be fair and accurate and open about what I'm doing. And and also, clearly, I make a lot of fun of myself in my books, so um, I, I try and at least be even-handed in that regard. But it is a, it's something you think about at 3 in the morning uh, a lot. Something that I think about now that I had never thought about before I read your book that's going to be really helpful for me as a teacher uh, that teaches world history to my students is the fact that you use the term creation myth for the Pilgrim story, and I teach my students, creationists, of all these other cultures, and, I, and I, I'm so excited now because now I can present the comparison. We here in America, we have, you know, just like the Sumerians, the early, early civilization of Mesopotamia, we have a creation myth too, and I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Well, it struck me, I think I didn't write about it in the book, but you know, we, we read the accounts of these explorers as well. They're constantly, they're traipsing all around America, and they're always saying, you know, these superstitious natives, and they're always going on, and, you know, can you believe they believe this or that? Meanwhile, they're chasing after seven cities of gold, the Nile and the Amazons, and all this, you know, so myth is a very powerful force, not just, you know, as you say, for all cultures, and particularly creationists. We all want to know, you know, where we came from or what, all kinds of, even as I talk about at the end of the book, baseball, our creation myth of baseball. So, yeah, I think it is a, uh, it's very arbitrary. Um, uh, last time I was here, uh, uh, I talked about, I had a really, to me, very interesting experience, classroom experience when I was here at the JCB in the fall. I sat in on the uh, American History Survey class taught by a young historian here, Carl Jacoby. Uh, it's called History 51, and in the first day, we opened by talking about the history of the class itself. And it's been taught for a hundred years, or roughly, at Brown. And he raised the question, well, where do you even begin American history? And he said, when this course started in the 1920s, they began in the 1780s with the political creation of the US. Then it crept back to 1776, then to 1620, you know, over the decades, and back to 1492. And then he made the point that these are all arbitrary dates that if you actually look at the entirety of human history in America, roughly 12,000 years, although people think now maybe even more, and he were to divide up these 24 lectures in the semester, give each each period equal time, 
that, you know, the history since 1492 would be one out of the 24 lectures. And U.S. history would be half of that last lecture. So, you know, it is, um, you know, I think we kind of have to maybe open people's minds a little bit to how we just think about this history and how we frame this history in the first place. And we are so used to sort of textbook timelines and textbook borders as well. I'm sure as we've talked about this week, you know, to try and do American history confined to present day U.S. borders really makes no sense in this era where it's flowing through the Caribbean and Canada, et cetera. So uh, it's a tricky thing to do, but I do think we need to uh, try and expand people's notions of what is American history. Yeah. I actually, the part of the book that I really found I learned something and I found it very funny too. It's part of the requirement permit. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that's something my, my students will probably actually understand and appreciate, especially when Chris used to say, just kidding. And I done something that was somewhat hurtful to others. How did you find out of it? Especially probably the same the way that someone's whispered or say it modeled away from the Indians in order to complete their legal requirements before they were. Um, there are different sources and it's well documented. I mean, it's not an obscure, I'd love to tell you why. Dump this out of the archives in that. Seville or something. Um, uh, it's a it, it's a pretty well known and much debated by the Spanish themselves. That's another way in which I find when we talk about the Black Legend, find the Spanish very interesting. Is while they're doing these things that by our lights are terrible, they're debating it constantly. They're having this really century, and it probably goes on much longer. I don't know anything about the later period. You know, constant debates. Uh, and they're, almost every one of these explorers ends up in court. That's the other thing. They're very litigious, the, the Spanish. And again, I'm sure Ken can explain this better. All, you know, Coronado comes home and to Mexico, and he's you know put on trial. De Soto certainly would have been if he had survived. Oñate. Um, so they, they have this this constant debate. So the requerimento, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, um, or the summons, uh, was part of that of sort of establishing. These, these rules that they had break, but at least trying to contain it within, within these rules. But to me, it's, it's fascinating in another way that I think, again, maybe you can play with in the classroom, uh, is again, it gets back to the first contact issue. How do cultures that have never encountered each other before, how do they communicate, get along or not, trade, all of the the bizarre things that go on, uh, and the kind of arrogance of the Spanish or really all Europeans in that situation. They're going to march in. I mean, it's almost like Monty Python or something. You've got this scroll, and you're going to give this history of the world, beginning with you know Adam and Eve, and the, you know these natives who don't even understand your language are somehow going to accept that, fall to their knees, and say thank you, thank you. Um, so I don't know whether there are things you can do maybe with younger kids with role playing or in a classroom of. Um, you know, without language, what, what do you, how do you, how do you manage these these issues? And and also, you know, no two stories are the same. Some of them are nice stories. I talk in the Coronado chapter about a Hernando de Alarcon, who's the fellow who goes up the Colorado River, who for whatever reason just had good body language. He knew how to put Indians at ease and and you know respond to their signals and. So I, I find that a sort of fascinating study in human behavior, really. Um, how, how do people deal with this? And um, anyway, it's a little off what you were asking, but um, what, one thought I've been forming a little over this week is that um, we're talking about people who are not articulate by modern definition. So they, they don't speak the same languages, or they don't have written languages at all. And we're also trying to teach this, or you are all trying to teach this to young students who are also hesitant to speak out and to use big words. We might be teaching strategies around this, like um, Ken showed some of the Tovar. Did you show your two? Pic 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 tovar, right? There's yeah. some tovar. Pictographs. And maybe asking students to do pictographs about what they imagine the story was like, or to try to use, get away from long sentences and long written passages to talk about this. Stuff. But I think asking them to use their visual imaginations might work, or I mean, play acting and what laughs at. But to get at the awkwardness of these early encounters, using the awkward actors in your classrooms might might be profitable in some way. Sorry, there were some questions. Yeah. Um, your hypothetical. 
if we were to discover Stone Age culture today, what do you think would be the morally correct response to that? Well, you know, this came up actually a couple weeks ago, although I gather there was some adjustment to this story. Did you remember a couple weeks ago there were some um, photographs from the air of a tribe in the Amazon, I think in Brazil, that, and they were sort of aiming bows and arrows up at the airplane. And, you know, they called them uncontacted. Well, it's not entirely true. They're obviously aware that there's another world out there. And it sounds like, from what I read, the government of Brazil really has this debate about, well, what do you do about these tribes that are still out there? And I think the general feeling is to kind of leave them alone. That we know something that people from this era did not, first of all, which is that we're lethal, first of all, with disease. Um, and, and also, in many ways, with other things, culture, etc. I don't know, it's a, it's a tricky issue, uh, but I would say, Probably the, the view would be to sort of as much as possible leave them be. Uh, but maybe, I don't know, maybe that's the wrong, I don't know. On the other hand, then you're saying, well, we're not going to share our modern medicine. So I, I think it's a really, I don't think there is a good answer to it. And I don't, in my travels, I haven't seen a country that's really got it right. I mean, I've spent time in Australia and New Zealand. You know, a lot of countries that have tried to manage this how do you either assimilate the indigenous population or give them their own, you know, how do you do it? And, and they're really, you know, to date isn't, you know, doesn't seem to be a clear, I mean, people that decide for themselves, obviously, and that's kind of where we're at now, but. Uh, Australia has apologized officially to the Aborigines. Yes. Are there financial gifts that have been made around? Yeah, that's, well, that's more complicated. Yeah, no, but it's a, uh, one reason I think they were so resistant to apologize is because there's this fear that it opens the floodgates to some kind of right. uh, 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 material, you know, reparations, etc. And I, I don't know exactly. Australia, there's a lot of uh, argument over the land, right? right. So it the land, so it's ongoing. It's it's um, it's different in every country. What's distinctive to me about Australia is. Um, Aborigine, you know, I think we also tend to see indigenous people monolithically, you know, they're sort of whatever, Stone Age people, and, you know, and, and all the tribes in America were the same, and I'm sure as Charles Mann talked about the other day, I mean, you know, uh, there was, you know, probably more diversity here in America than there was in Europe in terms of language and culture and everything else at, at that time of contact. Um, and what fascinated me in the time I spent with uh, Aboriginal people was good at, is, and it's documented by Kathy Cook when he first meets them, they really have no interest in Western material culture. A cook and, and labor source would come and they would leave clothes and all the trinkets and, you know, uh, on, the, on the beach and, and the Aborigines would come up and kind of look at them and leave them there. And I think there's some of that still today. Aborigines really are just not that interested in Western goodies. And it, it's a really interesting you know, profoundly different cultures. How do you, how do you, how do you work together in that situation? Yeah. yeah um, fortunately, a few years ago, my school allowed uh, me to teach an elective geography, and one of the films I did show was *The Animal Forest*, which John John Gorman, where his son was captured, uh, taken on the site of the uh, building of uh, a dam in Brazil, and absorbed into the indigenous tribe, and it's a great um, travel log of, of what literally they called the people of being the, uh, the Westerners coming down everything as those outside, you know, off the side of the world. Right. It's, it's the yeah. Emerald Forest. It's from 1985. Oh, great. And his son would like it too because it is a young boy who is, for 10 years does live with him and then there is contact with his father and the decision should he go with his father. No, but there are, I mean, all through American history, these wonderful captivity narratives, as they're known, of whether uh, by Indians and also in this period, and the early Spanish and the natives. And, yeah, it's a fantastic. And they, they tend to, the tongue usually is a different challenge, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I have to say, the Days of the Mothra movie, when I saw it, I mean, it's a very weird treatment. I would say that it's a very documentary treatment. Tonight we're getting another long. Oh, yeah, oh, that's something uh, happens.
We need a, we need a lot of coffee to get this. This is very direct to God. I've heard it. It's a great So I'm sorry. It's a great thing. Deeply weird. Area and standards. Treated the same as other Native right, Americans, right? Were. So they were excluded from all the treaty. Um, and you know, I was quite shocked. I mean, I think you know, as Americans, you know, it's you know, in your book you talk. You know, it's sometimes quite shocking to go back in American history and just read. You know, we stole a lot. I mean, there's no way you can read yeah. that history from the late 1800s and read it as anything other than a bald land grab. Um, well, and even Garfield's represent. Yeah. They've been investigated since. Back. Yeah, he's the president. I think it was a Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland, I think, said, give it back. I mean, it was a. It was but a it was election year, and it was sugar yeah. was. Yeah, exactly. Issue. It was really naked imperialism. So I think they have a, a good historical case. The problem is, who is a Native Hawaiian in this day and age? Um, uh, you know, I think it was a sort of subtext of this book. You know, these racial definitions are, are very rubbery. Um, and how you decide who is entitled to what. Um, also, there does seem to be quite a radical fringe to that Native Hawaiian movement that uh, uh, is fascinating, but no, I don't know the latest other than it's, a, you know, yeah, it's an ongoing, very tricky. Maybe with, if Barack is elected president, the whole Hawaii story would be more. I, I was particularly struck with um, DeSoto's cruelty. Yeah. Um, I, I knew that they were cool, but that extent was just yeah. mind-boggling. Was there no outrage by any of DeSoto's men, or for that matter, the normal European at that time? Like Coronado and like many others had been put on trial, and um, he, he clearly, at least to the people that I wrote about, you know, he's out there on his own. It's just, you know, fascinating. I mean, he's a fascinating figure. And again, I think students, sadly, will respond to DeSoto. He's such a strong figure. Uh, such a dramatic figure, and what he does is, you know, even if, if by our standards it's monstrous, you still, your jaw has to drop it, you know, this 4,000 mile death march across the south, it's just astonishing that they did it. Uh, it's a little bit like a hero, you know, he's a bit like an Aguirre figure, but you'll see it tonight. So, uh, yeah, I think he, uh, in some ways, I didn't say it's the part of the book I like the most, but I, mean, I, was, I found him easiest to write about because he's such a, a big, bold, primary color kind of villain, really. Um, but an interesting one. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious because teachers, this is a conversation we have with ourselves all the time, what do you teach to students? So you as the explorer, historian, parent, I mean, what, what do you teach your, your son? I guess he's in quite a different uh, my, son's, my older son is now going into seventh grade. We just uh, 10 days ago adopted a five-year-old. So while we're in kindergarten, so I have no idea what, what the, um, he doesn't speak English yet. So that's the, the first hurdle. Um, I, I failed utterly uh, getting my son. I've been trying to, you know, read him history since he was old enough to, you know, in the cradle and have failed utterly. Um, <laughs> Which may speak to, partly to me, um, he has only interest in history when he wants to go to sleep. And I say, Dad, he's going to be really boring. <laughs> Knock me out. But I, I think Ted might concur in this. To me, history is almost, it, it, it's something you either get or you don't. You're, you're almost not like you're born with it, but it's almost like religion or something. You're either, it's something that you're just, you know, because uh, their brother and sister had the same education up here. And I'm fascinated by history. They couldn't be more horrified. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of, I'm not sure one can explain what it is about 
staring at us at an old penny, I think we wrote about once as a kid, you know, or stamps or, you know, something about the past that, that draws you in. So I, I think there's maybe a limit to, you know, how you can't excite everyone, but that's not necessarily what you're asking. Um, I think they're just great stories from this period. And again, it seems to me we can be a, a little bit too pious about our history, and there's room for humor and drama, and yeah, even some blood and guts. And kids like great stories. Um, I mean, another one I think that would be fun to teach, particularly for any of you who are from North Carolina, and probably you do, The Lost Colony of Road. I mean, everyone loves a mystery. Well, that, that again strikes me as a great classroom. Here, you know, read the, you know, the sources of which there are not that many, and actually pretty easy reading. It's in English, and it's a good story. What happened to these people? And here are different theories, and you know, what, what are the different possibilities with this historical mystery that we can't answer? Um, I, I think you have some fun with the history, I guess is what I'm saying. I, I think partly because we, we so often begin with the pilgrims, they're, I mean, forgive me, but they're kind of, I know you love them. They're, they're, they're kind of a dreary lot for most kids, I think. I, I don't think, and then we jump ahead to the whole powdered wig phase with the founding fathers who, again, are fascinating to some of us, but maybe not for a lot of kids the most thrilling figures. Well, you know, you've got, you've got, you know, uh, butchers and cannibals and, and Pocahontas. You've got some good stuff to work, good, good stories. I mean, you tell me, what are, what are kids, just in what you do teach, the standard curriculum, what are, what are the bits that they really respond to? I mean, that's kind of funny as a follow-up, because there's not many men in elementary Right. And so this is a conversation we have a lot, that, and I hopefully I won't distance myself from the other part of the profession, but you know, a lot of the women teachers will be the nice, soft, bunny stories. And, so and it's the guy teachers. And it's the guy teachers. I mean, we like the same thing. And so we tend to get, I mean, at least in schools of people I talk to, the guys tend to get a bit more writing out of uh, male students because we like those kind of stories as well. Women are the funny teachers, whatever. Well, no, just the fluffy stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <you're digging> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My students really love the sacrifice and the blood letting to the genitals. And so I take, I have to. I did mention elementary school. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
tradition that was uh, in flower when I was a teenager and in my 20s. So in that sense, yeah, certainly influenced by it. George Plimpton, the guy, do you remember the guy yeah. who got to the play with the Detroit Tigers? And what was he playing doing? Played four plays and lost 60 yards. I mean, these stories are also tend to be very self deprecating. Um, Tom Wolfe in a different way. So, yeah, it was all those people were certainly writers out of the world. Yeah. Um, you brought up a really interesting point about Mexico and how Mexico was the Independence Day. Now the black, we have to you know, honor this culture, and you know, when they're no longer a threat, 
begins with a Maori haka, the welcome, the, the Maori custom, there's a constant acknowledgement of that native presence in a way, a native legacy in a way that you don't see in this country. I'm from Florida at FSU when we started football games. Oh, you're from New Zealand. Okay, you know about this. But no, Florida State University. Oh, Florida State. Florida State. I'm sorry. Well, that's such a complicated point because some Native Americans find it offensive. Yeah, it's also a celebration. I mean, the Seminoles, you know, it's, 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 it is a kind of homage in a way. Cleveland Indians, the same thing, or the Washington Redskins. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, to just change all the names to the bunnies or the armadillos. <laughs> but you don't want simple stereotypes either. Um, I had a question. Um, earlier you were talking about the format of your book, and if all your books are like this, then you must be away a lot on these various adventures, and does that get expensive, and you're away from your family a lot? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I definitely try to be away less and less. Um, uh, my first few books, uh, my wife was also a writer. Uh, we didn't have children yet, and she was doing much the same. So we would kind of take turns, or actually did, and try to travel at the same time. So we could be back together, etc. It was less of an issue, but yeah, certainly um, it, it is, and I, I think this might be my last hurrah for the uh, this sort of half-travel genre for that reason. It, it's just um, uh, it's, it's not terribly compatible with having a family, at least long open-ended trips. If you keep it, you know, Days here to me, but that um, uh, part of the fun of doing this kind of book is to actually go off and not have a plan and just see where it takes you. Um, so um, I, I think this is kind of a young person's game, and I'm not a, not a young person anymore. So um, uh, I think if you like to write this kind of stuff, I encourage you to go out and do it now. <laughs> uh, later on, when it becomes more complicated, the expense is. Um, a different issue, I, I get a book advance and, you know, you just try and budget. Uh, this book wasn't too bad. The last one, for the latitudes, I was traveling all over the Pacific, and also I had a traveling companion uh, who was a very heavy drinker at the bar <laughs> bill alone. Um, uh, you know, almost ate up my book advance. So, yeah, you do have to, have to factor that. I tend to travel cheap. I, I stay at a lot of book events. Um, uh, but, uh, it, you know, it is, it is a problem with writing, you know, doing this kind of work. Yeah. A former colleague of mine is now the director of the British Museum, or the American Museum in, in England, and, and she was saying that the thing that fascinates her demographic the most about our history is our treatment of the Native Americans and our treatment of um, the civil rights movement, the African Americans. Did you find that in, in your international travels, when they found the Jordan American and you were working on a history book, they were asking, well, what's your story about this? Or how, did you, how do you get away with, with you know, your imperialism here when really you were treating people that way? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're constantly being, frankly, generally lectured uh, <laughs> by people about, you know, uh, and, you know, it's a fair point, you know, particularly if we're going around the world trying to promote human rights, democracy, whatever. Fair enough. Uh, let's, let's examine the... Skeletons in our own closet. So um, you know, a lot of lot of lively debates. The only thing that bothers me about it is I think you know often just as we're ill informed about other countries, um, often people aren't you know uh, aren't very. Well, I think they don't uh, understand sometimes just the size and complexity of this country. You know, um, and you know it's hard to you know have lived here. So um, yeah, that, that's always and certainly when I was in the Middle East. Yeah. Oh yeah, boy, they love. And, you know, if you're in Iran, you know, they'll have documentaries at night on the Iranian TV about, I don't know, you know, god awful treatment of the African Americans and Native Americans. You know, it's a stock part of, you know, um, whatever, depicting us as the great Satan. And some of it fair, and some of it, some of it not. What I found that's kind of perverse about living overseas, and I've been some time overseas, you, you, you sometimes find yourself defending the other. You become. More, more patriotic than you ever <laughs> just because you get annoyed right. again when people are saying things that are just ill informed and so you find yourself sticking up for things that you wouldn't necessarily you know, <laughs> but when you're kind of besieged by it overseas you, uh, yeah it's, it's an interesting exercise seeing your, your own country from outside because there are things that you do um, start to seem insane about America you know and I won't go into 
won't go into it because it might be people will disagree with me, but certain certain aspects of our public policy that from perspective of a place like in Australia, you know, I'll give one gun ownership. I mean, you know, um, you know, you're living in a place like Australia where nobody owns guns and you you know, you look and you think this is madness. And then there are other things you look at and you think, wow, I never really appreciated this about America. For instance, as a journalist, just uh, the free speech that we have. Uh, even in Australia, um, journalists are constantly getting sued when they write things um, because the, the libel laws there. The protection of the freedom of the press is uh, not the same in the UK and Australia, for instance, is here. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a good exercise. Should we sign a few books? Happy to talk to you individually. I'm not going anywhere, but I know the time, so we have to move on. So, um, um, anyway, thanks. thanks for this. Nothing about that story here in America, and I kind of suspected that many Americans uh, shared my ignorance. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the starting point. You, you, um, you must have read widely before starting? What, what is your writing process? You just start reading, is it, is it general books? Do you go for academic books? Hot novel, novelizations? Um, I, you know, generally, uh, I mean, I, I tend to bite into top, big topics that I don't necessarily know a lot about at the start, which is maybe a different approach from a, an academic historian who uh, begins with a subject that, that they know a lot about and try and build on that and sort of burrow in and, and have quite a maybe a quite a narrow focus and try to uncover new material. Um, and it's not really my mission. So I uh, you know, begin by reading generally secondary works. And uh, in this case, um, uh, Samuel Eliot Morrison, a name that's probably come up this week. You know, one of the great, you know, great place to start. Big magisterial, great read, a bit old fashioned, but great place to start. And then uh, books like that, and then start looking at their sources and you know, getting to the primary sources, and then just really losing myself in the material. Uh, I think, again, that's um, maybe how uh, my approach as a, a non-professional historian would be different. Um, I, I like to, I guess I found as a journalist, the best stories are always the ones you're not looking for at the start, and that there's value to simply getting lost in your material um, for, for until you start to see a path or a theme or, or a particular way of, of approaching it. And we've been focusing in from there. I didn't go into Tony's CV, but he was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and other publications and won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting and he wrote a book about Iraq well before there was Longer a clear reason to write about Iraq. Uh, and it's amazing you mentioned Morrison. We were talking a bit about him this morning. Kristen teaches um, with Morrison and Howard Zinn, who are in many ways the opposite. And I guess Zinn actually attacks Morrison. I forgot about that. but. Um, I think Morrison is amazing. I know the camera. Uh, the founding fathers, the Civil War and World War II account for, I forgot the percentage, but some blinding percentage of uh, all the history books that come out in America every year. Um, and that there's so many Civil War books that it's uh, essentially one book has been published every day since Appomattox. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think I was uh, really drawn to this era just out of my own ignorance. Um, I, um, someone who, as I talk about in the book, I, I was someone who really thought of myself as a history nerd since early childhood. Uh, was the kind of kid who lined up my little plastic presidents, you know, by my bed every night before I went to sleep in order. Um, you know, my siblings thought I was uh, insufferable um, and studied history here at Brown and. You know, thought I had a grip on American history and then realized that really I didn't have a clue about this era that you've been talking about all week. Um, so I think that was one starting point. Another was um, in between the Civil War book and this one, I did a book about Captain Cook, uh, Blue Latitudes. And Captain Cook was really the uh, first European to explore much of the Pacific. And what I loved about his story. Uh, my wife's Australian, so that was, uh, I, I had spent a lot of time in Australia and became interested in Captain Cook. But what I loved about his story was really the drama of first contact between European and Native peoples. Um, this is an experience that we really can't have no matter how far we travel. Yet, 200 years ago, Cook in the Pacific had it innumerable times. Um, 
And as I was doing that book, I think at some point the light bulb went on that, you know, I don't know anything about that story in America, that we start generally with, we sort of do our unit on Columbus and then our, our unit on the pilgrims, and there might be a little bit in between, but we kind of actually skip over what to me is, is this very rich story, which is what happened when kind of the old world and the new world first collided, uh, you know, uh, in, mostly in the 16th century. Uh, and again, sort of here I was, I knew all about that story in the Pacific, and I knew nothing was running in order to end my academic career to say that I like him, but I, I do think he's a great writer and puts you in the story. He, he uses the first person. He has a few books as if I went to follow in Columbus's clips out, and it's really gripping stuff. He brings his nautical knowledge to bear. He, well, he's a wonderfully lively writer. Uh, his footnotes are fabulous. Um, he also is a great writer about writing history. Uh, I forgot the names of the essays, maybe you would know. He, he wrote several essays about writing history. And one of the things he said that struck me is that sort of you can learn more about Western pioneering by taking a camping trip than reading all the books in you know, <laughs> Widener Library. And that's a little flip, but I think um, I also take a little inspiration from him in terms of hands-on history that, um, yes, history is document-based, but yeah, you can take it a step further. You can do as he did and sail around the Caribbean in the wake of Columbus, or in my case, do a bit of reenacting, or simply to go to the places where history happened. Um, uh, by all accounts, he was a terrible man. I don't know. I mean, uh, a terrible misogynist. He refused to teach Radcliffe uh, students. Exactly. And uh, was famous for savage reviews that I think in one case killed a fellow historian who I mean, wow. killed over after reading wow. a Samuel Elliott <laughs> Morrison review of his newest book. But I, I think he, uh, you know, uh, writes in a way that not many people do today. That kind of, a little bit like Shelby Foote with the Civil War, that kind of sweeping right. narrative history uh, in a way that people are become much more specialized, I would say, uh, since then. You heard a story about Morrison going to an American Historical Association conference, and there was a reception filled with people, and he walked in a diagonal line from one corner to the opposite, and the crowd kind of parted, and then he walked back to where he started, and someone said, what are you doing? And he said, can't you see I'm mixing? <laughs> <laughs> he was very patrician. Yeah. He rode his horse, too. Did he? Yeah, yeah. Harvard. I think he had a horse or something. Anyway, <laughs> interesting. Do any of you assign um, novels in your classes? Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Tony Horowitz to all of you. You've all met him through reading his book, which they read in advance on YouTube, A Voyage Long and Strange, which Tony wrote partially here at the JCB and uh, used many of our illustrations, including the great cover one, which looks a bit like an Edward Gorey cartoon. <laughs> Tony, Tony has proven something that uh, many of your students would find difficult to believe, that it's possible to study history intensively and have a lot of fun at the same time. And you can tell that every sentence that he, he writes, he's enjoying the pursuit of the past. And that is allowed. We are allowed to have fun at uh, what we've chosen to do. Um, it's been, for me, really exciting to get to know him. We, we talked about the, the black legend this morning. About a year ago, I, I didn't know what that was. I just, I studied Anglo-American history my whole time in grad school, and I, I, I was, and I still am, pretty ignorant of the Spanish part of the story, although I'm trying to do better, and this week has helped me a lot. But there was a brilliant op-ed in the New York Times in July of 06. I can't quite remember. So two years ago, but on the black legend and how wrong it was and how how blinkered we tend to be as citizens of the U.S. and ignoring the huge part of our history that is Hispanic. And, and that got me excited to to read Tony's forthcoming book. And I I guess I found you by email. I was sort of an internet stalker, and, I, <laughs> and he was in the final stages and. and he needed a place to finish up the book, and he, he lives on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off of, um, off of the United States, uh, off of Massachusetts, and not too far from here. So we had a nice time last fall for a few months. And um, as I was writing my book and putting it through its paces, I haven't mentioned you, I have a pretty new book out. And Tony, last spring, sent me this uh, email with a note of alarm with a copy of an article from Publishers Weekly that announced that David McCullough, 
America's favorite historian, was writing a book with nearly the same title as mine on the exact same topic. It was coming out one month earlier. And I sent it to my publisher, this very proper gentleman, who issued a stream of foreign syllable <laughs> words that I've never heard. Of. <laughs> it was an amazing day. And then he said, you know, by the way, it is April 1st. Is it possible Tony's playing a joke? <laughs> process was like and how he writes history in, in a different voice than many of the authors we read in a song. And I think it's fair to say it's a more journalistic voice. But even that's not quite the right word because it's it's primarily in the first person. It's about his search for the artifacts and the places where this happened. And there's not a lot of me in history usually. And I, I think that might be something we talk about profitably because Asking your students to put themselves into their essays might be something they, they enjoy a lot. They're still figuring out who they are in grade school and high school. And, and just to write about a trip to a place like a Plymouth plantation or a California mission or the Alamo might, might work quite well. So um, I guess I should begin with an obvious question. Where, where did this book come from? You, Tony wrote a very well-known book about the Civil War Confederates in the Attic, which I'm sure many of you have read, but how, how did you go back 200, 300 years from, you were doing great as a Civil War guy, there was no need to, to leave that, it's a good niche. A lot of people buy Civil War books, but then you took this plunge into the, the deep cast. Publishers would say you should stay with it. Right. Um, there was a good essay written by um, Adam Hochschild, who's a journalist who writes history, and he talks about the 